So the 12 basic functions, usually we have a lot of fun with this day because um, and we'll group you up and have you work with each other to investigate the ones that aren't necessarily going to be as um, cut and dry as the others. And when you look at this, the 12 basic functions are just that. You know, they're supposed to be basic. So a lot of them are things you've already seen, like y equals x squared. That's the basic formula for parabolas. It's our parent function for parabolas. Y equals the absolute value of x. It, it's just some really, really basic functions. Um, in fact, one of them is the line y equals x, because that's the parent function for lines. Now, hopefully, when I write that up there, you're like, oh, yeah, that's the line that goes through 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, and you kind of picture it in your mind. Because what I've been leading you up to as we've gone through the last section is we want to analyze functions. And analysis means tell us everything that you know that we've learned about that we could do with these functions. Now, that said, lots of them are ones you've seen before. But there are four of them in here that you're probably not going to be incredibly comfortable with, at least four. There might be a fifth one. And um, so that's the reason we usually put you together and just say, today is about investigating. Use your Chromebook, use your book, use your brain, you know, just go through and find all of these things. But what I want to do is lead you through what is, is probably one you've never seen before um, today together. And then hopefully that will give you a feel for what we mean by analyze when we say analyze and graph. So this one is called the greatest integer function. And books, again, when they try to type them, they don't necessarily have all the necessary fonts that are needed for math. So the greatest integer function is supposed to be like double absolute value lines. That's what it's supposed to look like. And that's why some people mistake it for an absolute value graph. They're like, I've never seen this two lines thing before. Um, so this must just be absolute value and they made some kind of mistake. It's not. It's called the greatest integer function. And many books have now gone to this look. Because for some reason that was easier to get a computer to do than just the double bars. So either one of those is for what's called the greatest integer function. It's a very unique function. And like I said, and stole this out of one of the books here, notice that this is even different than what we see up there. It's just about what font did they use when they were typing. So for all real numbers x, the greatest integer function returns the largest integer that is less than or equal to x. Okay, so that would mean I need to know what the integers are. The integers are negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. So that's incredibly important to this function. I'm going to put the dot, dot, dots here. No fractions, no decimals, only the nice numbers, you know, the integers there. So, like it says, in essence, it rounds down any real number to the nearest integer. So we think about it for a second. If it's a 1 that we're supposed to evaluate, well, the greatest integer that would be less than or equal to 1 would be 1 itself. But if we do 1.5, now we have to go back down to 1 again to find that less than or equal integer. For 3.7, it would be 3. For 4.3, it would be 4. And then just a reminder here that with negatives, when we're talking about less than, you have to think about the number line. So for negative 2, it would be negative 2. But from negative 1.6, now we have to go down to negative 2. So this gives us a really unique look. So just start thinking about what does it look like. Function name greatest integer function. And this should go on when we 
those little squares each hand there, because this is one of the 12. And then since we're talking about all of these as functions, we want to use that notation, f of x, g of x, whatever it is, it doesn't make a difference. But like I said, the very first writing of grapes into a function just had the double absolute value times there. So now, I probably better figure out what this graphic can look like so that I can do all this analysis. And I realized, well, they told me for zero, it's going to be zero, because that would be the greatest integer. But then, as I go to 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, I'm supposed to round all of those down to zero until I get one. Once I get to one, the greatest integer for one is one. So that means I can't include it, which means I need a little donut hole there to show this is where this portion of the graph stops. And then I have to make this jump up to one. And then I start all over again. 1.1, .1, greatest integer function would give me back a one. 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, 1 1.6, all of those are going to go down to 1 until I get to 2. Donut hole. Hard to make with this. I suppose I better really exaggerate that. The marker's so thick. Once I get to 2, it makes the jump up to 2. 1.2, 2.3, 2.4, down to 2. And I realized, well, this is a pattern that's just going to keep continuing. That doesn't look like an open water. I had to make this as big as I could without losing a lot of it. And then I remember, oh yeah, the negatives are good too. You know, that's that's okay. So um, with my negatives, oh well, if I have negative 0.5, because negative one is smaller than that, that would go down here. So it is just going to continue the pattern, you know, it's going to kind of drop down. Sometimes I wish these markers were smaller, but then I know we wouldn't be able to see them in the back. Now this continues on. Because the integers continue on. And you think about the number line, it goes on forever. Oh, you good people that aren't here, I probably better try and finish this up as best I can. Okay. So now comes the analysis part. So now we have an understanding of what it looks like. And I need to let you know that this is the most basic, what's called a step function out there, the greatest integer function. Now this could be separated into a piecewise function, which we've done a little bit of work with. And we realize, okay, so for every little step here, you could break this apart into a piecewise function. Wouldn't be a lot of fun, but you could, you know, because there's an infinite amount of them. So as a step function, you can see why it's called that. You know, it looks like a little set of steps as you're going up here. And I look at the domain, and I realize, well, this integer is gone forever, so I can use whatever x's I want to. So in interval notation, that'll be my negative infinity to infinity. But now, I realize there's a problem with the range. And how do you write that? You know, how do you, how do you tell people um, there's space in between all of these y's? And really the easiest way to do it is going to be with some set builder notation and to say it's y 
such that y is defined as y equals the integers. So that doesn't normally, it's, it's not looking like in our interval notation because we can't. Interval notation would be horrible for this, but easier to do with set building. So now I go down to the next piece of the analysis, which would be the continuity. Uh, no, I definitely have to pick up my marker to draw this thing. So it's not continuous. Um, we could say it has jump discontinuity. Has it all over the place. So normally we'd like to see just continuous, be able to write that down, but this one's definitely not the jump to this discontinuity. And then we have to tell them, you know, is this increasing, is this decreasing? And they realize, well, we, we can't really do that because it's it's well, horizontal lines all the way through. So again, that would be constants. And so we have to go down here to constant and figure out how do we explain what we see here? Because it's constant from 0 to 1, not including the, the 0 to 1 piece. Again, because these are intervals, so we're not going to put square brackets on anything. But then from 1 to 2, and from 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 5, you know, and back to the left. So we're just going to put dot, 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 both ways. And this is one of the reasons I'm doing this one with you, because this is so different than all of the other graphs that you're going to see here. So now, down here, we see all the other things that we're supposed to know about a graph, and we analyze it. And they ask for boundedness. Well, no. I mean, it's going up weird, but it's going up forever, and it's going down forever, so I really can't put anything there. Um, symmetry. It's not even. It's not odd. So uh, I'll just leave that blank, or I could put neither in there. A local max or a local min? Well, no. I mean, as soon as you go to the next set of integers, now it's a, a different step up there. So there's a whole lot of these we're having to keep blank. So it doesn't really, it's not bounded. It doesn't have symmetry. It's not a local max. It's not a local min. There's definitely not um, vertical asymptotes and horizontal asymptotes as we know them. But there is any behavior. So I think, okay, if we go to the left forever, where is this graph going? Well, it's going down. It is. It's going in steps, but it's going down. So negative infinity. And then as we go to the right forever, it is going up. Going in steps, but it's going. So this is one of the things where you're going to notice in some of the work that we've done, we've talked about negative infinity and positive infinity. A couple of years ago, they made, well, a couple of years in math, it's probably more like 10. They made the decision that it's kind of redundant to write positive infinity because infinity is positive infinity. We still need it as we're thinking about these limits down here for this notation to let people know. But And that's, that's more a matter of it's been done that way for hundreds of years, so... That's the way they're going to continue to do it. So this is going to negative infinity, and this is going to positive infinity, which is just infinity. And that's the best we can do for this one. It is. Now, this is actually on your calculator. It's not something you would first look at. And you will want your calculators today if you're investigating the other 11 here, so you might want to grab those now. And what I want to do is just see, you know, how good a job does the graphing calculator do with the greatest integer function? So I'm going to go into y equals, and then I have to find that doggone greatest integer function on there. And that would be under math and numbers, so arrow to the right once for numbers. And this is where it's, it's, it's kind of like 
They didn't even put a G in front of it. I don't know, maybe the word G-I-N-T is bad or something. I don't know. They just decided to make it I-N-T parentheses. Unless some of you, this is the color one though too. Is there anything anybody has that's fancier than I-N-T or is it just I-N-T on everybody's? So we'll put an X in there. And I'll just hit zoom six. And the problem with that is, you know, we're not going to see the open holes. Um, so it is better to do this one by hand. And like I said, it's not necessarily difficult. It's just different. It's brand new to us, the greatest integer function. And the name is also kind of weird because it's called the greatest integer function, but then you're supposed to use less than or equal to when you go through and do it. So um, it's, it's kind of a, a trick. Now, the other ones that you're going to have to do that are going to be new to you today I want to show you some things that you have to do on your calculator to talk about the trig functions, sine and cosine. So with sine and cosine, sine and cosine are based on pi, because they're trig functions, and trig functions come from working with the unit circle. So if I wanted to graph the sine of x, I can't do that in degrees. I mean, your whole life you've spent doing math in degrees, and it's because it's the easiest way to do it. But this year, we want to talk in terms of pi. So first thing I have to do is go into my mode, and I have to change this from degrees back into radians. Now, mine already is because it comes from the factory in radians, but we usually change it in degrees as we're working in science class or we're working in math class. So while Blinky's over the top of radians, you definitely want to hit enter and make sure that's there. And then, that means we can't put in our normal x's because our normal numbers have to be things in terms of pi. So I'm going to go into the window. And this first time, let's just go from negative 2 pi to positive 2 pi. So negative 2, second, and then your little caret symbol. So that's what makes pi. And then as soon as we hit enter, that's going to give us a decimal. And then my max, I want that to be positive 2 pi. So 2, second, pi, enter. And if you were to take a look at these, you would realize that sine and cosine, um, as a parent function, they just go up and down 1. So my y's, I'll make negative 2 to 2, so that I can see a really good look at those. So if we hadn't changed this to radians, when we hit graph, we'd basically just see a straight line. And now we see this. So there's our sine graph. And those same settings are the types of things that you want to use for cosine as well. Then there's going to be one more that's, that's going to be part of the 12 basic functions that you won't have seen before. But like I said, I want you to investigate this one. That's the logistic function. So really wish you could work together. So maybe you just holler at each other every once in a while and say, what did you get for this one? You know? Yeah. But you can use your books. You can use your Chromebooks. You can use your graphing calculator. Obviously, you have to know what the 12 basic functions are before you can do anything with them. So uh, whatever you need to do for materials, go ahead and use it. I'll wander around periodically. And if you're thinking, oh boy, I don't know if I got this one right or not. I did already make a key of this um, and put it on Schoology. I have to double check and see if I opened it up for you yet. But uh, the first time around, I would really rather that you just investigated it yourself. If you need another one of these 12 basic function worksheets when you're done, because you know you, you didn't write it nice and neat and you want to make sure you have one, I have plenty. But today is about you investigating and analyzing the behavior of the 12 basic functions. So have at it, please.